إني ألقى الإيناس في صومي وصلاتي ودعائي للرحمن وجميع الطاعات. Sweden is the most. Um, we're here in Sweden, obviously, and it's the most feministic country in the world according to statistics. Let me just do this as a matter of um, try to see what's going on here. Put your hands up if you're a feminist. Let's just put it that way. Oh, my friend here is advocating women's rights. Okay. Him, okay, mashallah. Uh, okay, let's get started, all right? I'm gonna read something out, ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna read something out. Uh, what I want you guys to do, I want you to pay attention. And I want you to tell me whether you think what I'm about to read out is sexist or not. Yeah, according to feminism, according to your belief of feminism. If, if you think what I'm about to read out is sexist or not, let me read it out. If I say, woman is more emotional. Woman is more emotional, nervous, and irritable. And usually can manifest serious psychological problems. Women have hormones which mean they are more, which mean they have more stability and less control, make them more emotional, which is directly linked to vascular variations, palpitations, redness, and so on. And they are thus subject to convulsive attacks, tears, nervous laughter, and hysterics. Woman is weaker than man. She has less muscular strength, fewer red blood cells, a lesser respiratory capacity, she runs less quickly, lifts less heavy weights. There is practically no sport in which she can compete with him. She cannot enter a fight with a man. Added to that is instability, lack of control, and fragility that have been discussed. These are facts. Her grasp of the world is thus more limited. She has less firmness and perseverance in the projects that she is also less able to carry out. If I said something like this, it sounds what? Let's be honest, it sounds from a feministic perspective, very sexist. But when you see who wrote this, it becomes quite interesting. Because the person who wrote these things is Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote a book called The Second Sex, which is a French book which is translated into many different languages. In 1949, she writes this from page 42 to 46, 47. You can look at this yourself. She's a feminist. In fact, not only any feminist and not a radical feminist, but she is a mainstream feminist, which not only laid the groundwork for other feminists to come, but she led the theoretical and philosophical underpinnings of, you could say, even all of feminism in the second wave. She is very, very influential in the feminist movement. So why would she say these things? I mean, it sounds like she's going against women here. If I said this as a man and not prefaced or qualified the fact that it was a woman who said it was actually a main feminist, I could be attacked. But the reason why she says this, and her argument is as follows. <coughs> her argument is yes, and this is the argument of feminism, okay? The argument is, yes, there are biological differences between men and women. We agree. Men are stronger, women are more emotional. We understand that. For the most part, this is a true statement. She says, we know that. But her argument is as follows, ladies and gentlemen. You must know the argument of feminism, especially second wave feminism. The argument, yes, there are differences. However, it doesn't matter. This is basically the argument. And why doesn't it matter? Okay. The feminist will argue, and this is exactly her argument. There is, and this is going to be a little bit complicated, but try your best to understand, okay? Try your best to understand. In philosophy, there's something called existentialism, and there's something called essentialism, okay? It's a bit complicated. Essentialism is the fact that you have certain characteristics, it could be biological, it could be spiritual, it could be whatever kind of characteristics that are part of you as a human being and your f function is a result of those things which are endowed to you. They're things that you have, yeah? Existentialism is the idea that you have to kind of make your own purpose in life. It's subjective, it's your own purpose in life, yeah? 
So essentialism is that you act according to what your, your composition is, your essential composition. And existentialism is you make your own purpose, you make your own subjective purpose. And this is espoused by someone called John Paul Sartre, existentialism and other people. The feminist movement and the philosophy, the, the philosophy of feminism is based really on existentialism, which means we don't care about the differences between man and woman, for the most part, which are biological or emotional or psychological. Despite those differences, there should be equality. Do you understand this understanding, yeah? Despite those differences, there should be equality. But the question will come, the first question, we have a right to ask, as critical thinkers, we have a right to ask this question. Why? Why should we follow something subjective? And why should we disregard the essential properties of human beings? Why should we disregard the differences between men and women? Why? What proof do you have of that? What's the reason for that? What's the logic behind it? And there are questions that you could ask. Wouldn't it mean, you could ask, is it the case, is it possible, that when you strip men and women from their, let's say, paternal slash maternal instinct, meaning a man's want, psychological want to be a father, or a mother's want to be a mother, and you strip them away from these notions, will that have an effect on them psychologically? These are questions. Because if you're saying, if you're saying that children, uh, sorry, if you're saying that your essence, your biological essence is not really, we don't care about it so long as equality is, or so much as equality is concerned, the question is why. Now, here's another point. De Beauvoir, the same woman, and this is why, personally, I cannot identify with feminism. I'll tell you the reason. Because of these things. She paints the picture of males, men, males, not just males in the human species, but males everywhere, as actually inheriting a kind of original sin of being a man. Let me tell you what she writes. Talking about mammals. She goes, the most concrete and most individual life, life is found in mammals. The split of the two vital moments maintaining and creating takes place definitively in the separation of the sexes. In this branching out, and considering branching out only uh, in vertebrates, the mother has the closest connection to her offspring while the father is more uninterested. The whole organism of the female is adapted to and determined by the servitude of maternity while sexual prerogative is the interest of the male. Meaning here, Yanni, She's saying males by nature want to, do, yani males by nature, not just human beings, but generally they want to, they're by nature, yeah, dominating. They put women in servitude positions. We have to change that. Do you understand? So what we have to accept as men, if you want to be a feminist man, you have to accept that you are born as an oppressor by nature. You're born as a bad man. Just by virtue of being a male. That you have a prerogative, which means you, you're going to want to suppress a woman in, in whatever which way. This is the kind of thing that Simone de Beauvoir is trying to espouse. So the question here really is, is this substantiated psychologically, philosophically, emotionally and economically? Another thing could be this, and this is something I really want to put, because we talked about, number one, the philosophical underpinnings of feminism and the psychological ramifications of it. But a secondary question, are you guys with me? Yeah? A secondary question is, has feminism misinterpreted history? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I want you to, I'm going to give you a story. Let's make this into a form of a story. Before we make the story, I want to say something. One of the things that feminism says, and if you look at almost any book of the second wave, one thing is common, which is that mothers, wives, their servants, or slaves, Simone de Beauvoir actually calls them slaves. If you're a mother or if you're a wife, you're a slave. Yes, why? Because you're in the house, yeah? You're doing all the work of that man, all right? You're, you're cooking for him, you're cleaning for him, you're not getting paid for it, okay? You're a slave. You're, you're looking after his children, you are a slave. This is the feminist narrative, okay? Let me give you a story. Imagine we have a woman. What's the popular Swedish name for a woman? Kevinna. <laughs> Let's go with the chef's preference, yeah? Is this actually... Alright, Kevinna, yeah? 
We don't want to spend too much time with this, guys. I know you guys are, you know. Alright. So Anna is a popular feminist name. Uh, sorry, no. <laughs> Woman's name. Let's say you got Anna. Okay, listen to this. Anna, she's at home now, yeah? She has a husband. Anna feels obliged, in this context, this is a story, she, to go out and work for her husband. She has to make the money in the house, yeah? The husband stays at home. His name is Oliver, okay? <laughs> Oliver stays at home. Anna, I was going to say Lizzie, I don't know why I said you see that? Anna is the one who's making the money, yes? She spends the money on her husband and the children, okay? Now, a big siren is there, yeah? There's a big siren. And it says that there's a war going on. Anna has to go out, and all of the women in society have to go out by force and fight for the lives of the men, okay? They have to go and, f she has to go and fight for the lives of the men. By force, not just, it's not an option, she has to fight for that. Anna works in a coal mining place. You know the coal mining when you go underneath and you try and... And every time Anna's in that place, rocks, they fall near Anna. They fall. You know, big rocks. So Anna's every day, she's at risk of death. Anna has a friend called Lizzie. And she works in a garbage, you know, cleaning garbage. And she has lots of problems, hernia, this and that. <coughs> Anna goes back to her husband, Oliver. And Oliver says to Anna, you know, I believe I'm a slave in this relationship. <laughs> you know? You have all the power. You're going out there, making all the money, and you have all the power. I'm a slave. But then Anna says, listen, actually, I don't think that's right. I risk my life for this family. How many wars have we gone through? I nearly died in war, Anna says. Anna goes on to say, the reason why I haven't got a finger is because it was blown up by the enemy in war. Anna continues. <coughs> and Anna says, in fact, all the money I make, or most of it at least, goes to you and the kids. So how can you be calling me a slave, Oliver, when it's more likely that I am the slave? Anna says, I am giving you all my money, most of my money. And I come home tired because I've lifted lots of heavy stuff and you're telling me that you're my slave? You're a slave to me? How does that even make sense? I'm the one doing all the work in this relationship. So Oliver says, no, you're not doing all the work. Maybe he has got a point. He says, look, I'm looking after the kids. I'm doing a bit of cleaning and cooking. Yeah, of course I'm doing work. So Anna says, yeah, I appreciate that actually. You're right. What have I just described here? I've described the reality of the feminist movement, whereby the feminist movement has forced us to reevaluate the roles of women in society, but it has not forced us to reevaluate the roles of men in society. The feminist movement is a movement which calls human male sacrifice power. There's an interesting book written by, his name is Warrell Farron, and he wrote The Myth of Male Power. A lot of the statistics indicate what I'm saying here. Warrell Farron, he says in the book, that according to his research, he wrote this book in 93 and then in 2001 he kind of done a second copy or whatever, yeah? So he's constantly looking at the statistics. He says, first and foremost, men, if you look at, okay, because feminists will say, but look, there's a gender gap, men make more than women in work, and there's lots of problems. He says this is not true. And you know why he says it's not true? He says you're comparing the wrong things. Why are you comparing the fact that a man is making more than a woman as a gross income and not comparing the fact that women have more as net profit and spending money. 
And he said using statistics in his books, and you can find it in his end notes of his books, that actually in the United States context, women have more net spending power than men. In fact, they have £14,000 per year, $14,000 per year, and men have 10000 So he shows that even if you go now to any mall, that the majority of the mall is tailoring women's preferences. Why? Because women have more spending power. So the, the people, the advertisers and the companies, they have to facilitate for women. In other words, he says, women are to big businesses like bosses because they are shaping spending habits and shaping the products that are being sold. Because obviously demand equals supply. The, the supply of, this is economics, it's basic economics. And he says also that the draft, is called in America the draft, or the obligatory military service. If it had been imposed upon women, every feminist would say this is something which cannot be tolerated. Because why, how can you force women to fight and die for you? Just in the same way I would argue that you can force men to do that for all of civilization in all of the countries of humanity. I don't know of one country in the whole of human history which has forced women to fight and die for men. I don't know of a country. Not one. And you can compare this with slavery? Wallahi, if anything is going to be slavery, it's this. Slaves, black slaves that worked in American cotton picking farms, picking cotton, risking their lives, are more closely correlated to those men in war who are dying for the future of their countries, which means that their women and children will be protected. There's more of a parallel with men's, uh, men's jobs and occupations in slavery than there is with women's in slavery, because there's more hazardous occupations. 99% of hazardous occupations, according to him, 99% of, of hazardous occupations are occupied by men. I want you to think about one thing, and this is what he says in the book. He says, think about the fact that women occupy about 99% of safe occupations, like being a secretary. Yeah, most, that's according to him, in American context, most secretaries are women. Yeah, if you go to a place, the receptionist, the secretary, she's a woman. Now imagine now, in her workplace, this woman, the ceilings are falling down. The ceilings, they're falling down. What's the feminist movement going to do? Say, listen, how dare you put our women in this position of uh, hazardous situation? How dare you? You know that women are part of this, they, they make the largest constituents, constituency gender of this particular occupation. How dare you put them in this position? But no one ever says that when the rock falls from the mining, from the place where the men does mining. Why? Because men are expected to die for women. Full stop. Men are expected to die for women. Full stop. Don't tell us that men are being the oppressor here and that we have some original sin of being a man. This is not what we're going to accept. Well, that's an unfair analysis. All of, in male history and all of history, men have been protecting women. That's what's happened. If you want to call that protection, oppression, that's, I believe, oppression. That's the oppression. Now, the, the feminists will argue, but listen, are you, are you denying the fact that a woman is a unpaid, yes, I'm denying that actually, because she gets paid more than the man if you look at the economic Indicators. She gets given more by the man. He works, he gives it to the woman. Now, not all the time, well, there's bad men may, maybe here in Sweden that don't do this kind of things. But this is the way that civilization has been working for the, for the last 8,000, 9,000 years. For the most part, this is the reality. Okay? Having said this, it's really important to ask a question now. When a man is in a position, listen to this, I want to give you another scenario. If a man is in a position, and this is something Farrell says also in his book, if a, if a man is in a position, he's working in a small business, yeah? Man working in a small business. I don't know what they sell here in Sweden. Uh, IT products, okay? Sony Ericsson or something like that. He's, he's working, and now he's in uh, Sony Ericsson office, and now there are a certain amount of women, uh, a certain amount of people that are underneath him. Say he's a supervisor, he's supervising two people in his office. His boss comes to him and says, listen, tomorrow you're going to supervise four people. Yeah? So now we've expanded your, your role of responsibility. You're not going to just supervise two people, you're going to supervise four people. Yeah? Would we, put your hands up if you would see that this is more power given to the man. Be honest. Has the man now got more power? He's got more power, yeah? Because now he's supervising more people. Okay. 
If a woman has more children, is she supervising more? According to the traditional roles, if she was a traditional mother and a house, housewife, she'd be supervising more people. In using the same logic, you should say she has more power. She has more power because now she's supervising more people. But that's not recognized by feminism. Basically, the role and influence and power of mothers is disregarded by the feminist movement. Mothers are powerful agents in society which shape society in ways which cannot be measured. That is the reason why when a man, his power is referred to in economic terms and the invisible economy of the mother in the home is never measured. A woman has more power in most cases, in most even Western countries, she can change the kids' views so she can hate, they can hate their father. She has the power to do that. And there are cases upon cases upon cases upon cases of women doing that in many of the Western civilized countries, which by the way, favors women in custodian, uh, cust yani custody and things like that. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't, by the way. I'm just making the point that if it was equality, it wouldn't be like that. If it was actually equality, feminists would be against this because equality should be everything is the same. The man is actually, the father is the same as the mother. Yeah, according to feminism, in Islam, obviously, we know that's not true because we believe in a kind of essentialism. We, can't, we, we accept a kind of biological determinism. We accept that, okay, she, she's the one who had them in the, in the womb for nine months or her in the womb and then she gave birth and she's breastfeeding. She deserves more rights in this regard. But if you're a feminist, you can't say that because actually as a feminist, you can only say that they should be equal, no matter what. As Ngozi said in her book, she goes to 15 stages of feminism. She said, number one is that we're equal no matter what. And so yeah, and even as a mother, you're equal. You've, done, you've demoted yourself. You've made yourself lower. Why have you done this to yourself? Because you believe in existentialism. You believe in your own subjective morality, which you have invented. You've disregarded the science and disregarded the psychology and disregarded the, the sociology and the economics. And you now want to superimpose an idealistic understanding of society as per an egalitarian view. And by the way, there's a lot of big words. I'm sorry if you don't understand. <laughs> but the point really is this. The point is, has feminism therefore failed to consider men's roles? And my answer is yes. Now the point is, the point I'm going to make to you guys is, these are the questions we're going to ask. We're going to be asked lots of questions regarding women's rights because we, we go around, Ali, don't we? We go around, and I will tell you about 70 to 80 percent of the questions that people ask about Islam. Why is a woman not allowed to, uh, yani, have four husbands? Or why is it the case that you know a man can divorce easier than the woman? Why, 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 why? Because we don't believe in an we don't believe in an absolute equality. We believe in a general equality. And that is more tenable. If you say, because the Prophet said, Inna man nasa he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that certainly men are equal to women. He said this. However, it's generally the case. We have exceptions in, in inheritance, we have exceptions in marriage, and this and that. If you don't want there to be exceptions, you will fall. You will have problems in society. You can't say anything about maternity leave. You should abolish it. This is the reality. So what I'm saying here is. This narrative of men are the oppressors and the, the slave owners while women are the oppressed and the, and, the, and the slaves, this has to be broken before we can discuss anything else. We can't talk about equality and this. No, I'm not going to accept this. Well, it's, it's completely unfair. What you've done to men, what feminists have done to men is unfair. No man from the... Yani, men nowadays, they don't really want to talk about this because it will have repercussions for their life. Yani. But we have to have our own... Seriously, we have to have our own intellectual courage to come out and say, you know what? I don't believe in the history that you've given me. I don't believe in the psychology that you've given me. You're, you're wrong on these issues. And therefore, I don't accept your premise. So when you ask me about divorce, why is it in Islam? Yeah, that a man can divorce more easily than the woman. You're assuming they shouldn't. Why should you assume that? A woman can turn the kids against the man. She can do things to him which she can't do to her. There's powers she has that he does not have. How are you going to rectify that? How are you going to equalize that? How are you going to equalize the fact that a woman, which just by virtue, by biological virtue of the fact that she gives birth to a child, that that child will inherently, psychologically have an affinity to the mother more so than the father? How can you 
If that is the case, if that is a psychological, scientific reality that we can assert, then we must equalize that. We have to equalize the relationship between men and women. Don't expect there to be the same kind of rules for them, therefore. There has to be checks and balances in place. And that's why men can do certain things in Islam that women can't do. And that's why women can do certain things in Islam that men can't do. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْدُهُمْ مَنَا لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبُ مِمَّا كْتَسَبُوا وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبُ مِمَّا كْتَسَبُوا That do not want what the other one has. Don't wish to have what, like for example, you're a man, don't wish to have what the woman has. For the man is a portion of what he has earned, and for the woman is a portion of what she has earned. Some things are unequal by virtue of reality. And that's Islam has the answers to that. So when you ask questions about women's rights, just remember what I've said. 